Welcome everyone to the Antimicrobial Stewardship Project webinar series created by the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. I am Dr. Marty Peterson and I'll be your host and I'm also the outreach coordinator for this project. So today we're very lucky um, to have three infectious diseases and public health experts today to provide us this webinar. Phyllis Silver, Kavita Trevetti, and Dr. Belinda Otrowski. They will be presenting their webinars, as you see there, opportunities to improve antibiotic appropriateness in US ICUs, an experience from a multi-center evaluation, and we noted that this is pre-pandemic. So what they will be describing was actually published recently in Critical Care Medicine in April. So just a little bit about, about their background before the, we, they begin. Phyllis Silver will be our, our first speaker today, and we're very lucky to have her because she's very busy. Uh, she's most recently served as the Executive Director of the Partnership for Quality Care, which is a labor management coalition of healthcare providers and service employees, International Union healthcare workers. Prior to, do, to joining that organization, she spent over 30 years in public health service. More recently, right now, she's actually serving in the role at the New York State Department of Health. And she's in a, a very important role where she's overseeing nursing home, primary care and hospital, procedures, um, health, health, health and procedures for COVID. She can tell you a little bit more about that. The second speaker will be Dr. Kavita Trevetti. She's the founder of Trevetti Consultants, Consults and is an attending physician at the San Francisco Veterans Administration Medical Center. She's also a consultant for the World Health Organization. So she's got some interesting insights that she can provide to us today. Her healthcare consulting focus on quality improvement through strengthening local infection prevention and control in antibiotic stewardship programs. So we're lucky to have her with us today. Our final speaker is Dr. Belinda Otrowski. She's a for former healthcare epidemiologist and antimicrobial stewardship program director at Montfort Medical Center and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where she still remains on faculty. Uh, so this work came from, from when she was in that role there at Montfort. More recently, she made a transition to become a field medical officer for the CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion Station in New York. And she's also dealing with issues related to um, addressing COVID, healthcare associated infection, and multi resistant pathogens. So I'd like to welcome all three of our speakers to our webinar today and turn it over to Phyllis to begin her presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you all for participating today and inviting me to be here. I'm going to take a few moments of introduction to share with you the origin and the mission of the Partnership for Quality Care, which is referred to lovingly as PQC. In 2007, two visionary leaders, Dennis Rivera from the Service Employees International Union, people call SEIU, that's the Healthcare Workers Labor Union across the country, got together with George Halverson, who at the time was Kaiser Permanente CEO. They came together with this brainstorm that they had to form a labor management leadership alliance um, across the nation. Um, next, not, next slide, please, Kavita. So they invited the CEOs of these organizations um, and the union leaders of the respective hospitals and so we had the hospitals and the healthcare delivery systems and the union leaders sitting at the same table. They served as my board of directors with a very simple agenda of collaboratively addressing healthcare policy. The first agenda item that they had was to push for national healthcare reform. And this group really played a very major role in Washington and across the country organizing for the passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, lovingly known as Obamacare. Um, after the passage, the leadership agreed to commit its resources to addressing issues from a labor management perspective that would make all Americans healthier. In the early years, our work was in reducing uh, sepsis mortality, immunization of all healthcare workers, 
uh, promoting a national children's vaccination campaign, reducing prescription drug pricing, Medicaid reform, and you can count on one hand how overall successful we were with some of those, but we did have an impact on, on some of them as well. Um, next slide, please. On October 21st, 2014, it was the day after Ebola arrived stateside, we were in a meeting with Tom Frieden, and he was the CDC director at the time, and he turned to us and said, could PQC stand up a training session on behalf of CDC that could be attended by healthcare workers because Ebola has people frightened to death. So on, uh, I forget the date now actually, but it was um, right after that that we pulled together 6,000 healthcare workers at the Javits Center in New York City. We organized this session to observe um, a CDC uh, rep, um, Arjun Srinivasan, who did a first hands-on demonstration of wearing and removing PPE in the face of the potential Ebola outbreak. We obviously dodged that bullet, um, not so much today in what's going on, um, but those words have become household terms for everybody. Uh, the Javits Center in New York City as a healthcare facility option, uh, donning and doffing of PPEs, and now PPEs have become a household phrase. Uh, next slide. Um, it was about a year later um, that this coalition um, was asked again by CDC to take a look at the issue of antibiotic stewardship. They came back to us with a proposal that, that PQC might launch an antibiotic stewardship initiative that would address um, antibiotic resistance. We had the perfect organization to do it from their perspective. We had the healthcare workforce, the environmental services workforce were members of our organization, and the hospital systems were our members. So in collaboration with our, our board, uh, we chose three areas of engagement. The outpatient care setting, the role of the environmental services workers in infection control, and the inpatient setting, about which um, you're going to hear today um, one of our major successful efforts. PQC's model of working is a, is a model of collaboration that worked well in all of our previous work where we pulled together a guidance team of experts <coughs> excuse me, to assure commitment. We had the CEO of each hospital or healthcare delivery system identify a lead clinician to participate as the point person for the healthcare or hospital system. The union leader also the president chose an influential leader within its ranks to lead the workforce side, and they became team leaders. The guidance teams from across the country um, who took the lead in their facilities got on calls together, um, and then we were able to create um, an agenda of action. Next slide. So the smartest thing that I did um, in all of this work was to ask Kavita Trevetti to serve as a consultant to PQC in leading this work, um, to just emphasize the, the caliber of expertise that we had on this. I came to know Belinda um, through this process, Belinda Ostrowski, who you're also going to hear from today, as she was the point person identified by the CEO of Montefiore Medical System. And like all things uh, in life with six degrees of separation, Belinda and Kavita, of course, knew each other from the world that most of you participate in. Um, our work had the endorsement of the system's leaders, the commitment of the clinical leaders within the hospital systems, and at the end of the day, no one got paid extra for participating. Nobody was mandated or had to do this work. Everybody who participated in this worked on this um, out of their commitment to antibiotic stewardship and to people's lives. So um, that's sort of an introduction and background. I, with that, I will hand it over to Kavita and then Belinda to describe the project. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, for that um, wonderful introduction to PQC. Um, so I have the privilege to describe to you all uh, one of the projects that we engaged in 
um, with the antibiotic stewardship PQC guidance team. Um, and this is our experience on antibiotic appropriateness. Um, as Marnie already mentioned, this work was published just last month in Critical Care Medicine, and I wanted to highlight for you all the number of people and experts that we were lucky to work with, um, both that were authors as well as part of the PQC Inpatient Antimicrobial Stewardship Working Group. So um, the PQC Antibiotic Stewardship Guidance Team decided that um, the inpatient arm of our initiative would focus on um, a large scale assessment of antibiotic appropriateness. And when we were discussing wh what area of the hospital we should focus on, ICUs became a um, important area that many of our stewardship teams, although they were um, very advanced in uh, many of, of these settings, um, hadn't really had the opportunity to kind of uh, jump into. Um, as you all know, ICUs um, have the highest volume of inpatient antibiotics, so this seemed like a nice place for PQC to focus. We started off by conducting a pilot, a pilot point prevalence survey on October 5th of 2016. Um, and we followed that with the final survey, which is um, the data that I'm going to present to you today on March 1st, 2017. So we um, included ICUs across 12 U.S. hospitals uh, with a median bed size of 560 and um, a median licensed ICU bed size of 70. Uh, we included all patients that were receiving antibiotics um, in the participating ICUs on March 1st, 2017 for the final point prevalence survey. Um, the study tool that we used was in fact um, based and adapted from a CDC tool um, that actually many experts from our guidance team helped develop back in 2013 and 14. So this is still a tool that's available on the CDC website and I've included the, um, the link here. Uh, this is the assessment of appropriateness of inpatient antibiotics as recommended by the CDC. And what we did at PQC is we made this tool actionable um, with our expert group so that we could implement it across many hospitals. What we did is we developed both an individual assessment form and then an aggregate assessment form. The individual assessment form was to be used by um, antibiotic stewardship personnel at each hospital in order to assess patients on antibiotics. Um, the individual assessment form also asked the respondent to categorize antibiotic regimens as either empiric, directed, or prophylactic treatment. Um, and then we included a definition for antibiotic appropriateness and asked the respondent to identify the most salient reasons for inappropriateness. Um, all the data was de-identified at the hospital level and then submitted to PQC via an aggregate assessment form online. Um, and you can also find both the individual assessment form as well as the aggregate assessment form on the PQC website as noted at the bottom of the screen. So the definition we used for inappropriate antibiotic use um, was both from um, the literature as well as from the discussions we had on the expert team. So we had four major kind of categories for inappropriateness. The first one was the antibiotics were not indicated at all. So there was actually no infection or no evidence for infection um, or the um, infection being treated was actually non-bacterial or they were treating colonization or contamination. The second major category was uh, the issue of de-escalation, a lack of timely adjustment from empiric treatment to targeted therapy um, that should be done based on available microbiology data. The third category was selection of an inappropriate regimen due to um, an, an unsuitable spectrum of activity. So the spectrum of activity being too broad for the infection being treated or that the duration of therapy was too long. 
And then lastly, we also um, wanted to include incorrect dose, route, or interval uh, for infection uh, or based on the patient's renal function. Uh, we had no hierarchy of reasons for inappropriate use. We didn't, we didn't provide that to our respondents, to our participants. Um, it was their discretion to determine which reason for inappropriateness was the most important or the most salient. So, um, but for example, if a regimen was both not indicated and happened to be also the incorrect dose, obviously the more important um, reason would have been antibiotics weren't indicated at all. So we ended up having 47 ICUs participate from 12 hospitals. As Phyllis indicated, um, these 12 hospitals were all PQC partners, so all this work was done very collaboratively. Every single hospital reported an active antibiotic stewardship program, and that was defined as um, a set of coordinated interventions to improve and measure the appropriate use of antimicrobials by promoting the selection of an optimal um, antimicrobial drug regimen, uh, dose, duration of therapy, and route of administration. So all of these hospitals did have active um, uh, stewardship programs. So here's table one from our um, manuscript. And um, this shows kind of the demographics of our um, participating hospitals and ICUs. Um, you can see that we had four hospitals from New York State. I don't know if this works if I, if I move the, um, the pointer around. Um, we had four, oh yeah, maybe I can do this. Um, we had four, oops. Four hospitals from New York State participate, um, two from California, two from Florida, three from Massachusetts, and one from Minnesota. So we had um, a smattering of hospitals across the US. 83% of our hospitals were teaching hospitals. Um, and as I indicated earlier, um, when you look at bed size, uh, we had quite a range in terms of the 12 hospitals that participated from 250 beds all the way to 1,500 beds. Um, and then the number of licensed ICU beds also um, had quite a range between 20 and 270. All of the participating, participating hospitals did have an antibiogram available at the time of the study. Um, only one provided an ICU specific antibiogram and um, more than half uh, shared that they had a dedicated ICU pharmacist who was implementing antibiotic stewardship program interventions at the time of the study. And then we did ask about rapid diagnostic testing and um, various, um, uh, various laboratory uh, mechanisms to help with stewardship strategies. Um, and the two most common were uh, respiratory viral panels and MALDI-TOF. Um, in terms of the participating ICU types, 21% uh, of the ICUs that participated were surgical ICUs, 19% were medical ICUs. Uh, we, we ended up having four, uh, five neonatal ICUs, four pediatric ICUs, and then um, just one burn ICU that participated. Um, I will note that when we uh, conducted some of our analysis that I'll present in a, in a few slides, we did um, uh, also look at all surgical um, ICUs together as, as a group, all medical ICUs as a group and all cardiac ICUs as a group. So, um, um, so for example, for the cardiac ICUs, we, that would include the cardiac surgical ICUs as well as the telecardiac units. So on March 1st, uh, we had 667 ICU patients in the 47 participating ICUs. And of those 362 or 54% were receiving antibiotic treatment. Um, we, when we looked at the categorization of the antibiotic regimens, 61% of, of the antibiotic treatment courses were categorized as empiric, 24% as directed uh, therapy, and 21% as prophylactic. And I'll note that we did not make each of these categories um, exclusive. So if one antibiotic the patient was on was for empiric treatment and another was for prophylactic treatment, those could be counted separately. 
So of all of these antibiotic treatment regimens, we found 112 or 31% of the regimens to be inappropriate. And I'll also note that all of these regimens were antibiotics that had been administered for greater than 72 hours in our patients. So these were not regimens that would typically be um, um, targeted in an antibiotic timeout intervention that usually occurs at 48 to 72 hours. So here's figure one, and let me just orient you to this figure since it's, since it's fairly important. Um, the x-axis shows um, hospitals A through L, they're obviously anonymized. Um, the y-axis shows number of patients um, uh, on antibiotics in each of those hospitals. And these are, of course, all the ICUs are grouped together. There are multiple ICUs participated from one, um, from one hospital. The bars show that, again, the total number of patients on antibiotics in each hospital. And then the gray bar indicates the number of patients on inappropriate antibiotic therapy. And the percentage at the top shows the percentage of inappropriate based on, um, based on each hospital. So you can see a, a, a wide range of, um, of uh, inappropriate regimens. Um, our, our range was all the way from 9% inappropriateness, you see there in hospital D, all the way to 82% in hospital J. Um, but of course, you have to take into account how many patients were assessed in each, in each uh, hospital. Um, I want Belinda to mention this later, but we, we did hear from our, um, our participants that they appreciated being able to take this type of benchmarking uh, uh, graph back to their, both their ICU leadership as well as their um, hospital leadership to either show that they were you know, doing, doing well in terms of their ICU um, stewardship interventions or that they needed to um, focus more um, on the ICU to uh, improve their appropriateness. So of the 112 patients on inappropriate regimens, 48% um, were identified as prophylactic regimens, 31% empiric and 18% directed, which is probably not surprising that many of the inappropriate regimens were, were prophylactic um, treatments. Um, when we looked at bivariate analyses, comparing the prophylactic regimens to non-prophylactic regimens, we found an elevated risk ratio of 1.76 um, with a, a significant confidence interval for inappropriate treatment. So this means that um, if patients, if you were on a prophylactic regimen, you um, had an increased risk of being on inappropriate treatment, almost 1.7 times um, uh, elevated risk for inappropriate treatment compared to those on non-prophylactic regimens. Uh, this is table two where we looked at inappropriate antibiotic prescribing by ICU type. Um, and if you look at the very last column, um, so the first number is the number of patients with inappropriate regimens based on their ICU type, and the second number is the percentage. So here, the pediatric ICUs do pop out at 55% inappropriate um, antibiotic regimens, but I will just call your attention to the fact only four units um, participated with 66 patients, but still um, an interesting, uh, interesting finding. And then um, two other ones that also pop out are the cardiac surgical uh, units with 40% inappropriateness and also um, the, the burn unit. So there was, a, again, only one burn unit. Um, all of those patients, those six patients, were on antibiotics, but three of them were deemed to be inappropriate, which is why their, their, um, their inappropriate percentage is 50%. Uh, we looked, we did, we conducted bivariate analyses on the antibiotic prescribing by ICU type. And I've highlighted in bold here the significant um, risk ratios. So again, if you just kind of cruise down the table, you'll see that um, the prophylactic antibiotics are consistently uh, popping out and consistently um, significant in terms of our analyses. So in the surgical unit, prophylaxis uh, had an increased risk ratio for inappropriate use by 2.2. Um, uh, in the um, all, all, if you looked across all surgical units, uh, that 
uh, relationship um, was consistent. Uh, if you looked at medical, all medical ICUs, all cardiac ICUs, the risk ratio was elevated um, if you were on prophylactic treatment for um, the risk of develop or having an inappropriate antibiotic uh, regimen. And then the other thing to note is the pediatric ICUs here. So we noted before that there was a 55% um, uh, in terms of the number of patients that were identified as inappropriate. Um, and the risk ratio was also consistently high. So if you were in a pediatric ICU, um, you had a 1.9 times likelihood of um, increasing your um, uh, risk of being on an inappropriate regimen. So I wanted to mention uh, the reasons for inappropriate antibiotic use um, that we found. As, as I mentioned before, we, we had a clear definition and asked all of the respondents to um, identify the reason for inappropriate um, uh, regimens. So an the antibiotic was not indicated, um, but the uh, but the coverage or duration, sorry, the, indi the antibiotic was indicated in 63% of cases, but the coverage or duration was not appropriate. That, that happened um, kind of the most commonly, uh, and coverage was too broad and duration was too long. Um, in 31% of our cases, there, were, there was no antibiotic that was actually indicated at all. And then only in 6% of cases was the dose route or interval considered to be inappropriate. And finally, we did look at bivariate analyses based on these reasons for inappropriate therapy. And just to point out a couple of relationships here, uh, again, the pediatric ICUs, um, there was an elevated risk ratio for the reason of spectrum of activity being too broad, and that was a significant um, relationship. So that's the 1.96. Um, the, in, in the, the cardiac, the all cardiac units, which is the very bottom row, um, duration longer than necessary was also elevated at a risk ratio of 2.44, and that was also statistically significant. And the last one I want to mention is the neurologic ICUs, which um, there were, we didn't have that many uh, neurologic ICUs, neuro ICUs that participated, but it was striking that their, um, the bivariate analyses looking at their risk ratio for the inappropriate reason of dosing route or interval um, was 6.89, which, um, which was also statistically significant. So those were um, the bivariate analyses based on ICU type were, that were the most interesting and the most significant. So our findings of 31% inappropriate antibiotic use in 47 U.S. ICUs uh, was important and also was consistent with previous studies um, and was also, I should say, consistent with our pilot that we, we conducted earlier um, in um, 2016. Uh, as far as we un, uh, understand from uh, reviewing the literature, this is the first study to use standardized tools to assess antibiotic appropriateness in the United States. And um, we hope that other institutions would be encouraged to utilize the same tools to periodically assess antibiotic appropriateness. Um, and I, we think that was one of the major um, positive aspects of, uh, of this big collaboration. Some of the limitations uh, that need to be pointed out are that we obviously had a varying number of patients that were assessed at each hospital and a varying number of ICUs that participated at each hospital. Um, there was obviously interoperator variability given that various or, or, or different stewardship teams assessed um, patients in their own hospitals. Um, so we couldn't control for that given that we had so many different people filling out the forms. Um, but we do believe that this study highlights that when you focus in the ICU in terms of your stewardship strategies, you should consider targeting de-escalation of broad spectrum antibiotics, which I think is something that most people um, would, would try to do anyway. But this study certainly um, gives us some data and some real um, bivariate analyses showing us that there is certainly um, a risk of being more on inappropriate regimens if you um, if your spectrum of activity is too broad. And then secondly, duration of therapy should be targeted since many of these patients were, uh, who are identified as inappropriate were on therapy too long. 
And lastly, that prophylactic regimens should also be targeted in the ICUs. Uh, pediatric ICUs and burn ICUs may also represent some locations in need of stewardship interventions. I think um, this also uh, was an important finding, especially with just giving us some more um, interest and energy in, in addressing stewardship interventions in the pediatric setting. And um, I just want to end by saying many of our participating hospital stewardship teams found this assessment um, a nice way to introduce themselves to their hospital's ICU leadership and, um, and, uh, and clinicians, and a, a way to kind of grow their stewardship program beyond, um, beyond the medical wards. So um, with that, I'll pass it on to Belinda Ostrowski, who was one of our participating um, centers uh, from Montefiore, and she will discuss a little bit about um, what it was like to participate in this multi-center um, investigation. Hi, it's Belinda. So first, I, I want to actually make remarks in sort of four basic categories. The first is to really thank uh, Kavita and Phyllis um, and PQC as partners, especially thank all the collaborating facilities. Um, most importantly, Priya Nori, um, Rachel Bartash, and the Montefiore and Einstein team, who were really um, my team to uh, help us as we were doing this project. Um, this was a very interesting thing because I was both part of the team to develop the tools, but actually use it in our own facility. Um, so the second thing I really want to bring up is that often in ASP, we're tasked with optimizing antibiotic therapy. And really the hard part is not what we need to do, but how we really implement it and how we actually collect things to make change. And so, um, especially now, CDC and others have uh, modules or ways to aggregate antibiotics and look at volume, but it's not just the volume of antibiotics. You really need to figure out where there may be problematic or inappropriate prescribing. And so we think a tool such as this was really helpful because it's complementary that it's not just the volume, but it's really where there may be, um, you know, uh, things that can be amended. Um, the third thing just to mention is that the tool is fairly easy. Um, it's standardized and it only took a few minutes uh, to review each patient chart. Um, it allowed us to use our ASP skilled um, staff. But what was nice is that um, it seemed that it worked over several facilities. It worked in different kinds of ICUs. And even though it is um, somewhat categorized in how we um, walk um, the participant through evaluating the antibiotic um, that they are looking at, it can be adapted to whatever your need might be, um, which might be very different in, let's say, a pediatric ICU versus a burn unit. Um, the other thing is that it basically gives you data on which to potentially uh, intervene. And so really, it's not just that this is the end of the story, but this gives you a target, um, a way to potentially even come back and do this type of assessment serially so that if you were to put a stewardship intervention in place, you may be able to watch uh, serial changes in the appropriateness of the prescribing. And then um, the last large area I wanted to bring up, which is on the next slide, uh, Kavita, if you could change that, is that um, it's not just important to identify where there are problems, it's really to brainstorm where the targets and what the interventions might be to fix things. And so here are five examples of uh, things that were sort of themes that we saw from the prescribing. So um, one of the most commonly inappropriately prescribed antibiotics was vancomycin. And so from bringing the committee together after looking at the res these results, we said you know, that it would be important that we limit the use potentially of anti-staphylococcal medications such as vancomycin, and that maybe some examples that could be put into place would be educational initiatives or uh, computerized alerts, prospective audit and feedback protocols. Um, Kavita mentioned that for many of the inappropriate antibiotics, they were broader than needed. And so perhaps, or, or uh, of a too long a duration. And so we talked about de-escalating broad spectrum antibiotics through either antibiotic timeouts or antibiotic restrictions after 48 to 72 hours or potentially using our rapid diagno diagnostics. Um, improving the duration of therapy um, based on available data. 
using updated protocols that might specifically address appropriate lengths of therapy and computerized order sets for, let's say, surgical prophylaxis, where we noticed one of the most common over or uh, prescribing or um, inappropriate use was just leaving the duration of uh, prophylactic antibiotics way too long. Uh, we talked also about that there was a variation across different ICUs and especially, um, you know, more niche or, um, you know, uh, specialty populations such as pediatric or burn units having default renewals or some sort of documentation of the indication for antibiotics that could be reviewed by a, um, a specialist who would be more comfortable, let's say, in prescribing in these populations. And then last, I think Kavita really um, alluded to is that um, in starting to have a conversation with and partner with your critical care doctors, um, it's really nice to have benchmarking and have tangible data that you can share. And so um, rather than just come and conjecture and say, we think that X or Y antibiotic might be overprescribed, really coming with the literature and bringing the tool and showing the data and that um, we have concrete patients, but actually some sort of aggregation of how many patients potentially might have problematic prescribing, that these are things that would be helpful to bring back to the um, critical care um, and related teams, such as patient safety and quality officers. And so, um, you know, really, uh, as Kavita kind of alluded, is that this often might be the introduction to the critical care team, or honestly, for us, we at Monty had had a relationship with the critical care team for uh, quite a period. This might be a next step in trying to engage them in, you know, uh, other stewardship activities. So I'll pass it back to Kavita um, for closing and if anybody had any questions. Thank you, Belinda. Kavita, I don't know if you've got some closing remarks before we would go into the Q&A. Yeah, no, just that, um, j just to say that uh, we, this was an amazing collaboration through a very functional and um, uh, work, a, a very determined organization. And, um, but we do believe that the tools that we put together are actionable and are ready for use um, with, you know, broader, uh, broader groups. So we, I would just encourage you to go to the PQC website and look at our tools and see if, uh, if you might consider um, using them in your own hospital uh, to assess for antibiotic appropriateness. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's such an interesting collaboration. Um, and Kavita, you were just talking about the, the tools that people can um, utilize. Th there is a question that came in about that. Uh, the question is being, did you find that facilities with surveillance tools did better than those that did not, or was that a variable? I don't know if Kavita, you want to answer that one? Yeah, um, I don't quite know what she's referring to in terms of surveillance tools, but you know, all of the um, all of our participants obviously contribute to NHSN um, and um, participate in surveillance in that way. Um, Belinda, can you think of any other surveillance tools that, that we... Well, I, I do think that all of the uh, programs did have an active ASP already in place, and right. we're doing probably surveillance of the volumes of antibiotics. I think what this added was that complementary component of having, um, you know, the appropriateness. I mean, the other thing that they may be alluding to are um, some of them may have had electronic surveillance systems to potentially identify, you know, mismatches of antibiotics. I can't recall, you had it on one of your slides, how many did have these kind of programs. Um, I don't think that there was really a tremendous difference in the performance based on having, let's say, one of those electronic um, surveillance systems. Because Correct. remember, the, the system just identifies the opportunity, but what you really need is someone who understands antimicrobials and prescribing, uh, you know, to really act on that potential opportunity. 
So just to have the system isn't enough. And I think that's what was nice about this is that it was a simple way to identify some issues, but then it was really up to the stewardship team to take a look and see if it really made sense that this might be inappropriate and um, you know, really figure out what would be our next step. So you know, we didn't really go to the next part where we could see that we were able to decrease the antibiotics, but certainly you know, the hardest part is that at any given time, there are many, many patients in a hospital, especially in ICU on antibiotics. This may just make our time more efficient. So I don't know if that's a long answer, but I think it may yeah. be uh, what they're, you know, the, the issue that they're describing. Yeah, go ahead, Phyllis. I don't know if you, she had a comment as well. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a, a question um, that you, you noted that, I think it was over 50% of the institutes or the IC, the contributing ICUs had um, a designated stewardship pharmacist. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, did you do an analysis to look at, did the inappropriate prescribing track whether they had a designated stewardship pharmacist or not? Yes, Were that's a, that's a great question. And we, we, uh, we did, and we did not see any correlation um, with, with those stewardship pharmacists being, being present in the seven, seven hospitals. Um, I, I should say that it wasn't clear that the, the stewardship pharmacist was um, active in the ICU that participated always, right? Um, so, so that could have been a factor as well. But yes, it didn't, it didn't seem to track in terms of any significance or elevated um, or, or change in the risk ratio. That's interesting. Yeah, and the other thing is the, the um, I think it's figure one that you presented. There is can be quite a range of inappropriate prescribing. Um, some some very low and some some um, you know greater than fifty percent. So that's very interesting, and that's why I was wondering if it tracked at all with with the um, stewardship program. No, um, and I think Marnie, that just brings up the the kind of same point that Belinda mentioned that, you know, ideally this type of assessment would happen serially um, yeah. so that, you know, you can, um, you can continue to understand what's happening seasonally, if there are temporal trends or uh, other trends. Um, I think this, this kind of survey would be most useful done periodically um, and then the other point, just to address kind of what the um, question was about electronic surveillance systems, um, you know, the beauty of this type of assessment is you don't need any electronics to be able to do it. I mean, you can just, it's pencil and paper, you just go into a unit and look at everyone on antibiotics at any one time. So um, I think that this, this particular uh, activity uh, can be done certainly outside of electronic um, systems. And, um, and I think this, one of the strengths is, is that, you know, you don't, you don't need anything electronic to be able to do this. It's very, very simple. And you can just use one day and, um, you know, use a pharmacy student or, you know, whoever's interested and has the time to be able to do this uh, is, is kind of one of the strengths, yeah. I think, of the study. Yeah. I, the, the question I had right, right out, out the bat was, as you started to present, is why did you decide to conduct the study as a point prevalence study? So as I think as Phyllis mentioned at the very beginning, um, you know, we have, and, and everybody who's on this call knows that stewardship folks are super, super interested and in, in um, assessing what's going on with antibiotic use and how to improve interventions. And so we had a very interested guidance team mm -hmm. and, um, but we had no funding for them separately, right? So the reason the point prevalence survey was chosen is it seemed like that would be a low, kind of a low energy thing that we could do, but do across hospital systems in an easy way and also uh, have the ability to benchmark some of the data across, you know, across different hospital systems was another thing that people really liked. So um, yeah. it was kind of a low hanging fruit, if you will, for this yeah. particular group. Yeah. Uh, Belinda, yeah. do you want to comment about why we should? I, I agree. And in yeah. fact, I mean, what's in the paper is only what we could get de-identified from the places to aggregate. But each of the facilities actually had their own data and had more. I, I think I agree with Kavita that, you know, nobody was paid. Actually, everybody completely volunteered their time. So, 
you know, this was realistic. And even to do one day often took more than one day and several people because maybe right. it was 15 minutes or a half an hour, but we got a lot out of it. I would say that, you know, honestly, if you can do a longer period of time, that would be great. This just seemed that that snapshot that you could learn a lot from a really, you know, it, it was just, it sounds like, oh, it's just one day, but it's, you know, 300 plus patients. And so it, it was interesting how much there really were themes. There might be a somewhat a variation, but there were certain themes that just consistently we saw, let's say at each one of our ICUs within our system, and you could see across the ICUs. So, you know, sometimes something doesn't have to be really tremendously complicated to no. give you some just beginning of where to go because you can't target every single antibiotic, you know, in the house, it's just too much. So this was just the start for where is the direction that you might want to target. And then you might want to look at several more days. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's just a, a realistic and um, easy means to an end. Yeah, it's striking how much data you, you got from it. Right. It didn't really take, I mean, it sounds silly. It, it really wasn't one day's work. It was one day's worth of, of, of okay, this is where we're going to turn it on and do it. And we did it twice. But you could easily do this, you know, once a month or once a quarter at your facility. And I would think you would gain a lot of data. I mean, you even um, mentioned about the variability. Some of the variability might be because it was only one day. Correct. Yes. So you have to take it with a, a grain of salt, but I, I do think that there was a lot of insight just by getting some data as a virtual, as opposed to not having the data at all. Sorry, you were gonna. Oh, I was gonna ask Phyllis if she's still on with us. Um, what the the partnership for quality care that you were director of, you know, in that role at the time. What what did you ended up doing with the data? How did, at that level? So it's it's an interesting, it's a good question. The uh, Partnership for Quality Care um, had a couple of, um, it was sort of the perfect storm of a couple of things that happened at the same time. Um, and the, uh, rather than going into the details, the organization is on pause. Um, so that um, what we decided to do was to get the um, information out there and the best way to do that obviously was in, um, through publish publication in a journal and opportunities like this so that um, the tool itself could be actionable. So while the organization's on pause right now, we are, um, we still have a website where, as uh, Kavita mentioned, you can go and look at the information. Um, to a certain degree, it's a shame that um, we are paused um, because there's uh, so much um, fabulous collaboration. Um, and as you can imagine, the people that worked on projects like this across the country um, formed some sort of an informal network. Um, the, the collaborators on the article are an amazing group of, of clinical experts. Um, and I think that if you take a look, as, as, as Belinda was just saying, it was not a one-day project. I, mean, I, I thought after the, the um, initial um, effort in, in the fall when we tested the project that people would fall off, but they didn't at all. They came back to do the full study um, in, in, in um, several months later. So the commitment to doing this work by people like I'm assuming like on this call is quite astonishing. Um, and I think that what we wanted to do was to develop a tool that was actionable once we were done. So all of that's very positive. Um, right now, I don't think there's any bandwidth given what's going on with COVID, um, uh, but we're, I would hope that at some point in time in the future, um, there would be a, a leadership agenda to, to get back um, on, and do some other activities like this. Um, uh, we're sort of a, a, a group of people um, looking for a, um, a, a patron, so thank you. And, uh, is the tool available on the website? The, the Absolutely, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, can I just jump in, Marnie, and say something? Sure. Um, Absolutely. I just want to say that, uh, you know, we do have some more information now during the pandemic um, about how stewardship can still be included into um, you know, treatment decisions. Um, and I just wanna highlight that the WHO uh, put out 
um, new treatment or revised clinical treatment guidelines for COVID-19 this week. And in there, there are definitely now included uh, words about de-escalation of therapy um, and basically not considering antibiotic treatment uh, for many of these patients if, if um, there is mild to moderate um, uh, infection. So, um, you know, although this was done pre-pandemic, I think there are a lot of implications post-pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, we should still be trying to implement stewardship strategies uh, with our ICU patients. Yeah, that was, that's actually, thank you, Kavita, for that. And I think I would like to hear from the other speakers as well on this topic. Um, there was a question just to, to, on that very theme about doing this study or an ongoing study to look at the impact that COVID may be having on these stewardship programs. So it sounds like it could be when um, the Partnership for Quality Care is, is back uh, functioning again, um, unpaused, perhaps another point prevalence study might be of great value. So, um, I would say here, here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. And there's one more question that uh, is related to the paper. And then I'd like to just talk uh, on that um, topic a little bit of trends or observations or things that our expert speakers are finding in this new situation that we're in with the COVID pandemic as they're all uh, heavily engaged and leaders in is at currently the making decisions. Um, the final question here is they'd like to know, uh, the person would like to know if there were cases of non-adherence to microbiological lab reports by the clinicians with respect to culture sensitivity. So I think this gets at a question related to inappropriate antibiotic prescribing where they had the data but chose the different regimen. You know, there might be at individual facilities, but I don't think we would have had a way to completely analyze that in the aggregate. The problem is because we had to take the identifiers off, we didn't get all the microbiological data. So, you know, oh, okay. that that is a limitation here that we have just the um, assessment of each of the um, the teams as to whether things were inappropriate, et cetera. But we don't actually have that microbiological data to see whether the directed therapy really made sense, et cetera. Um, right. So, you know, that is a limitation because this was more an exercise and a, a tool in, or a strategy to try to assess antibiotics rather than, um, you know, completely every single detail about the prescribing of those 300 some odd patients. Right. But I'll just, each facility uh, could have looked, though, at this. Right, right. So I just was going to add that, that, um, you know, they did assess that de-escalation was not happening and, uh, and that being the salient reason for inappropriateness. So uh, we, could, we could presume that that was happening, that there was not adherence to microbiological lab reporting um, by physicians in some, in some of the cases. Um, but like Linda said, we don't have the granularity of the data. But you would have that if you use this at your facility because there are tool, tools. There's a, 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 a tool that you as the individual looking at each patient within your ICU can have and you can look at that data. We just chose to make it simple that once they filled it out for each patient, then we just asked them to roll it up and only send us the aggregate. So the paper um, really gives much less than the tool itself would allow you to see mm -hmm. in your own individual patients. There is one more question that I have before we get into the COVID. Uh, this, this, you know, this was a pre-pandemic, now post-pandemic situ situation. But the question is, based on these data, could we recommend that targeting patients on prophylactic therapy to ensure that it is appropriate would greatly improve the stewardship uh, metrics in the ICU setting? Is that something, Linda, that that your group did, or? You know, so that's one of the things I think that can be looked at. It seemed like that things were that, that was the top reason, at least in some of the surgical ICUs. But I do think that the that the issues were multifactorial in some of the other ICUs. So certainly, I think the thing is that you know um, you'd have to take the tool and look at it in your ICU. But if you did see that prophylaxis is a problem, then 
you know, I would go after then why is it that this is an issue? And then what can I do to try to fix this? So it's really case by case, depending on the data that you would have your own institution after you, you collect it using a tool. Um, and certainly antibiotic duration seems to be a good place to start as well. Um, so I'd like to just move to, you know, with the COVID pandemic and how these things may be changing. And Phyllis, you, you are, we were talking prior to the webinar that you are currently um, in the role at the New York State Department of Health uh, in this role to oversee uh, infection control and health for co overseeing the COVID project for nursing homes and, and other healthcare facilities. Um, and my, my question is, is, are you also considering stewardship as you try to lead this effort? Is that a component or is it just you've got other pressing issues? So um, I think that probably uh, uh, Belinda can speak to this a little bit um, because she's literally on site um, um, in a lot of these facilities as a CDC person. Um, uh, but I, I, I would say that right now, frankly, um, the staff at the State Department of Health um, are working 24-7, um, the, the folks um, overseeing these programs who usually do surveillance, who do infection control um, activities um, are, have most of them that I'm familiar with, um, the clinicians, the lawyers, uh, the surveillance uh, nurses um, are, haven't had many, most of them I would say, haven't had a day off in about 100 days. Um, I, I literally mean that. So the idea of um, uh, thinking of doing some research <laughs> with some of this information um, is just beyond anybody's. Uh, right now we're busy swabbing nurses to get them to be able to go into nursing homes to test the staff, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very um, high energy operational um, checking for doing infection control surveillance. Um, maybe Belinda, you could add, add to that. But in terms of um, research or studies, um, that's that's not on anybody's mind right now. It's life and death. Um, Belinda, did you want to add to that? No, I think that um, I would just say that you know I'm in a slightly different position than when this study was performed. But I know, speaking to my former institution, that stewardship may just need to change their role during an emergency. And, you know, um, speaking to some of my my colleagues, that, you know, sometimes the stewardship team can especially jump in when there are rapid changes, you know, maybe offering, um, you know, the right advice as the treatment regimens or prophylactic regimens may change for COVID or other emerging pathogens. I think that, you know, given that there were many critically ill patients, there may be a role for um, whether there should be or should not be empiric regimens for secondary bacterial infections, depending on where the patients are in their course. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a role, but it may be different. It may not be as, as Phyllis alluded to that this might not be the right time for, you know, some sort of study or anything extra, but it might be something that, um, that as stewardship people or infection control, we're often the people who are sort of nimble to react and change and help the institution when something novel comes in. And so I, I believe that my former institution, that the stewardship team has especially jumped in in these kind of, of roles. And then uh, Kavita alluded to that, you know, given that the patients are sick, that there are some protocols that may have been put into place about, um, you know, prescribing um, around, uh, you know, some of these ill patients for um, healthcare associated infections, et cetera. So, you know, I mean, I think that this study was done pre-COVID, but the beauty of the tool is that it basically can look at prescribing at any time for you to kind of look at, you know, what the situational awareness, how much antibiotic is out there and, you know, how the antibiotics are being used and where there might be an opportunity to enhance things. Absolutely, it's, it's trying to, address all the urgent issues at the same time, trying to not take your eye off of, of some of these key areas for stewardship that are important. And sounds like in particularly in certain categories of, of severity of disease, as Kavita mentioned. Uh, Kavita, we have about a minute left. And before I close, I didn't know if you wanted to say any final closing words. 
No, I just, I really appreciate everyone um, joining the webinar and because we know that everybody on the call has a thousand other things they could be doing. So we appreciate you joining and asking questions, um, even on a study that was done pre-COVID. But as Belinda said, we hope that, and we know that this, um, these tools uh, can be potentially useful during the pandemic as well and um, wish everybody, you know, to stay healthy. Absolutely. Thank you, Kavita. Thank you all so much. Um, Kavita is absolutely right. These are extremely busy people and we're so fortunate to have, have them join together as colleagues and, and co-authors on this paper, especially uh, Phyllis, that we could get you at the, at the last minute to join as well. Um, and you could stay on the webinar with us. So I'm going to close the webinar um, and conclude, conclude it by letting our participants know that the webinar was recorded, and so we will be posting this to our YouTube channel um, within the next day or two. So feel free to forward that along to your friends and colleagues for, for more viewage. And I wanted to thank our pre presenters so much for their time and their insights today. This was just a terrific webinar. And I also want to thank Maya Peters from our SIDREP ASP team, as she helps in the planning and production of these webinars. And then finally, to our panelists that join us, for participating. Feel free to visit our website uh, at sidrap.umn.edu forward slash ASP for more information. And you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter. And feel free to reach out to us at any time to send us your ideas on the next webinar topics. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks so much for having us.